Now that we've talked a little bit about intermolecular forces in pure substances, we're now going to spend a little bit of time talking about the intermolecular forces that occur in mixtures. So obviously two or more different substances mixed together. The same principle applies, positives attracting to negatives. But since we're talking about mixtures, we need to talk about what those forces are called. There are four that we're going to cover, and we're going to cover them very quickly. The key thing to keep in mind with all of them is that the name of the force is simply describing the two things that are attracting together. So in this first one, notice it's called ion-ion forces. So this would be an example where two ions are attracting to each other. This is actually also called ionic bonds or ionic forces. Um, and so sometimes people view the ionic bond as an actual intramolecular bond. Others view it as simply an intermolecular force just between two ions. Nevertheless, an ion-ion force, or an ionic bond, whatever you'd like to call it, is very strong. And so this explains why ionic compounds are solid at room conditions, because these forces are very strong. All right, the second one is called an ion-dipole force. Well, we know what an ion is, right? We know what that, if it's something maybe, for example, is, you know, the iron ion as an example. But remember, what does dipole mean? Dipole means a polar molecule. And so if you're looking at an ion dipole force, we're essentially looking at the attraction between an ion and a polar molecule. So for as an example, sodium chloride being dissolved in water, we would call this salt water, right? Salt water is a mixture. Well, what actually ends up happening is there is an attraction between the chlorine um, the chlorine ion and the positive hydrogens okay, on the waters. On the flip side, the positive sodium is attracted to the negative oxygens of the waters. That attraction that takes place between a polar molecule and an ion, like I said, is known as an ion dipole force. This, the third one is called an ion-induced dipole. So ion, once again, you should know what that is, but what does induced dipole mean? If you're inducing something, you are cre you're temporarily creating you know, a, a situation for it. And so an induced dipole essentially is you're creating a dipole on a molecule that was originally nonpolar. So an ion-induced dipole force is the attraction between ions and nonpolar molecules. As an example, let's take, for example, this nonpolar particle. Could be an atom, could be a molecule, doesn't matter. It's nonpolar, which means there is no separation of charge. It's all balanced. The electrons are generally evenly dispersed. But if all of a sudden now a positive particle gets near it, now this positive particle is going to induce a temporary dipole. So if the, po if the particle is positive, that would make sense that the electrons are going to shift onto this side, making it slightly negative, and making this side slightly positive. So this ion-induced dipole is what attracts right there. So it's kind of the same idea a little bit like London dispersion in the fact that it's a temporary shift of electrons, but it's not two, it's not two nonpolar molecules coming together. There is an ion that definitely has a charge, and it's doing something to a nonpolar molecule. And then finally, we have dipole-induced dipole. This is an attraction between a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule. Same idea as what we just saw before. The polar molecule is what has the permanent separation of charge. When it gets close to the nonpolar molecule, it will induce a temporary dipole. So for example, right here is shown an oxygen molecule, which is nonpolar. But if all of a sudden a water molecule, which is a polar molecule, gets close, it's going to create that temporary dipole in the oxygen. And that attraction that's between there is what's known as a dipole induced dipole attraction. In other words, between nonpolar and polar molecules. So a summary, we've talked about a lot of intermolecular forces. Keep this in mind. When the intermolecular forces are high, they're strong, that takes a lot of energy to weaken or even break those intermolecular forces. That means high melting and boiling points, and that relatively favors the solid phase. But if the intermolecular forces are generally weak, then that means little energy is needed to weaken or break the intermolecular forces. And therefore, that means that it equates to low melting and boiling points, 
and that typically favors the liquid or even gas phases. So let's take a look at some examples. Example number four. In, which, in each scenario, identify what intermolecular forces would exist between the two particles stated if they were mixed. Keyword there is mixed. So we're looking at mixtures, right? So those four that we just went through. So if you had oxygen and ammonia, so you have oxygen, which I'm going to draw as a molecule, and that somehow is going to be attracted to ammonia. And if you remember, ammonia is NH3. Okay, and I'm going to draw it structurally so you can kind of, there we go. Okay, so oxygen is a nonpolar, I'm going to, I'm going to just do it like this. Oxygen is nonpolar. It's a nonpolar molecule. Ammonia, hopefully by now you're realizing, is a polar molecule. So what attraction takes place between a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule? That is going to be a dipole induced dipole force. And yes, it's kind of obnoxious. You have to write the whole thing out. But that's, that's the attraction that would take place between the two. Next, we have a lithium ion and methanol. Well, a lithium ion is Li with a positive 1. I know it's positive 1 because it's an alkali metal. Methanol, we have this uh, structural formula here. So CH3 and OH. And you don't necessarily have to draw the structures out every single time. I'm doing it just to prove a point, but you don't have to do that. So lithium is going to be obviously an ion, and then methanol. Take a look at that particle. Do you think that's polar or nonpolar? That's definitely polar. Okay, the carbon hydrogen isn't polar, but you got this oxygen hydrogen part over here on the right. That's definitely this. It's throwing the whole molecule off, right? So there's definitely going to be an unbalance there. So you have an ion dipole force. And then finally, the last one, carbon dioxide, which is CO2, looks like this. And then it's going to have some sort of attraction to iron 3. Remember that Roman numeral 3 means that's its charge. So you have an ion, and then it's attracting to carbon dioxide, which if you remember, carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. Yes, it has polar bonds, but the polarities cancel each other out because it's linear, right? So it's nonpolar. So this one would be an ion-induced dipole force. All right, we'll see you in the next video for section two.